The Rotary Club of Columbus is a membership organization with a passion for service. Founded in 1915, we're one of Rotary's largest and oldest clubs worldwide. of serving as the 2019-2020 Club President. We all know the challenges the coronavirus pandemic has posed. Our club has faced tough times, including two world wars, but this is the first time we've had to suspend our in-person meetings. So instead of meeting here at the Trade Center, we're going to meet every week online until it's appropriate to return. So whether you're a member or a guest, thank you for joining us today. We're happy that you're here. Welcome to the April 29th meeting of the Rotary Club of Columbus. I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you for keeping Rotary on your calendar. We're reaching people through a number of ways. Uh, Facebook, both live and on demand, through YouTube, and even an audio-only format on our club conference line. I want to encourage any of you watching live to chat with your friends in the Facebook comments, um, ask questions of, your, of our speaker, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. Some of you may know that this week is World Immunization Week. This is a week where Rotarians and others come together to raise awareness about the importance of vaccinations and Rotary's work to end polio. There is no cure for polio and the effects can be severe, including paralysis. But it is, it is preventable by vaccine. And if you have any doubts about whether vaccines work, consider this. In 1988, there were over 350,000 cases of polio in over 125 countries throughout the world. And since massive vaccination efforts, we've now reduced the polio cases by over 99.9%. And we're down to three countries that are considered endemic and only two of those have reported cases of the wild polio virus in the last few years. And now at this time, we're gonna hear from polio survivor, Bob Prater, about his work to eradicate this awful disease. Thank you for this opportunity to share with you today. I was stricken with polio in 1950 at the age of four. The polio immunization did not come to my community until 1955. After the acute illness, it was felt that I would not have any major residuals. However, today I am suffering from late effects of polio. But that's another story. Thanks to God, the Indian government, and the Church of Nazarene's Compassionate Ministries, I've been able to work in India for the past 24 months as a reputation consultant. I have been privileged to work with many polio survivors. Thanks to the efforts of Rotary International, the World Health Organization, and many others, India was declared polio-free in 2014, but that was too late for between four and eight million individuals. I have seen many survivors who did not get the proper medical or orthopedic services that they needed. I have seen too many young adults who are suffering from contractures because they were not braced. I have also seen many who have outdated or ill-fitting orthopedic appliances. One of the major 
needs in the differently abled community is that of employment. These are some of the areas that I'm working on. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, for your efforts to help eradicate polio, and thank you for sharing your story with us today. Our club has a proud tradition of honoring an active duty soldier from nearby Fort Benning uh, as our soldier of the week. But the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, disease is causing disruption in a lot of ways, and, and there are weeks that we are not able to schedule a soldier. And that has prevented, presented us um, a nice opportunity to recognize one of our own. And at this time, Judy Thomas will recognize one of our own as Soldier of the Week. Thank you, uh, President Tyler. Fellow Rotarians, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our very special military guest today, our own retired Colonel Dick Nurnberg. Dick served in the United States Army for some 30 years, and I'm delighted to be able this afternoon to tell you a little bit more about his service and his life. He grew up uh, in New Jersey and received a Bachelor of Science degree in biology from uh, Bates College in Livingston, Maine, and a Doctorate of Dental Medicine degree from Tufts University uh, in Boston. He was commissioned in the United States um, Army Medical Service Corps in 1964 and in the Dental Corps in 67. After completing the officer's basic course, he was assigned to uh, Germany, where I've recently discovered uh, on a weekend pass to Spain, he and some of his fellow soldiers ran with the bulls, uh, ran ahead of the bulls, luckily. Um, in 1969, he was on orders to uh, Vietnam, but was diverted to Korea because of the Pueblo incident. Um, he completed the Army Command and General Staff College in um, Leavenworth, Fort Leavenworth in 1980, and as a result of that was stationed in several uh, Army posts across the country, including Fort Huachuca, uh, Arizona, Fort Rucker, Alabama, uh, Fort Dix, and Fort Ord. Those last two are where he um, inactivated um, due to uh, the base realignment and the con uh, BRAC. Um, his final assignment was as Commander uh, USA Dentac at Fort Benning, Georgia, where he retired in 1996. His awards are many and numerous, as you might imagine, but I would imagine, I would imagine that one of his most cherished is the Order of St. Maurice Award, which is given to an individual um, for their service to the infantry community. And as you might imagine, Dick received the highest level of that St. Maurice Award. <clears throat> he served as Director of Dental Hygiene at Columbus Tech for a couple of years before he, in, in 2001, became the Executive Director and President of the National Infantry Association. He served in that position until 2018. During that time, he also served on various other boards uh, throughout the community. He is married to Amy, and they have three grown sons and four great-grandsons. I'm sorry, not great-grandsons, grandsons. He joined uh, the Rotary Club of Columbus in 2004 and has taken part in all of the various um, programs of the Rotary, not only of Columbus, but Rotary International. Probably his biggest claim to fame in Rotary Club uh, is, however, renewed each fall as we play Rotary football. Each year, Dick selects um, his alma mater, Bates College, as the football team he's going to follow that season. Each year, Bates College scores the fewest number of points and is last on the scale of all of the teams that we follow. But 
each year, Dick gets at least one other Rotarian to select Bates College along with him and thus increase the pot for Rotary Foundation. And for that, we thank him. Congratulations, Dick, for all you've done for us and for our community and for our world. We appreciate it, and we're glad to have you in our midst. Thank you, Judy. And Dick, I also want to thank you for your service to our country and, and your dedication to our club. As Rotarians, we look for the silver lining, and the changes recently have been difficult, um, but this presents a nice opportunity, and I've thoroughly enjoyed getting to learn more about the heroes within our own club, and I hope you have as well. Uh, this week, we continue our series on our own Rotary leaders who are uh, presidents, CEOs, directors of organizations that are adapting during these times to continue to serve our community. And this week, Marianne Richter will tell us about the, how the Columbus Museum is adapting to serve. Thank you, President Tyler and fellow Rotarians. My name is Marianne Richter and I'm director of the Columbus Museum. The Columbus Museum closed its doors to the public on March 16th in keeping with policy of our partner organization, the Muskogee County School District, and for public health concerns. Since then, we have worked very hard to create a virtual museum, which you can access via our website, which is columbusmuseum.com, and there's a section called the Virtual Museum, which includes short interviews of 60 seconds with artists, um, talks by our curatorial team, educational material as well um, for adults, and then a separate section that's activities for families, since we know so many students are currently at home and learning from home and maybe looking for new opportunities to create art or learn about local history. In addition to those materials, we've also created outreach materials that we've distributed through the Muskogee County School District's daily free lunch program, and we will be doing that again so that students who don't have access to a computer still have a chance to create and learn about art. We know from studies that art um, and looking at objects in museums in general can help create a feeling of calm. So it's our hope that these virtual materials and outreach materials will help people feel connected um, with each other and with the greater world at large during um, some unusual times that we are facing. We look forward to welcoming everybody back to the museum in person very soon, but in the meantime, um, please everybody stay safe. Marianne, thank you for the creative ways that you and your staff have helped the Columbus Museum to serve our community. Please pass along our gratitude to your staff. As many of you know, and perhaps as a spoiler to our speaker, each week we thank our speakers by honoring them with a children's book that we donate to the Columbus uh, Public Library and have that speaker's name inscribed. And at this time, Alan Harkness will tell us more about this program. Thank you, President Tyler, and hello, fellow Rotarians. I'm Alan Harkness. I'm the director of the Chattahoochee Valley Libraries. We have four libraries here in Muskogee County and one each in three other counties in our region. I've been a Rotarian since 1998, with a couple years off when I worked for the State Library in Atlanta. So the topic I want to talk to you about today is our book program. As you may recall, each week the president, in this case President Tyler, lets each speaker know that they're being recognized by a book placed in the children's department at the Columbus Public Library. What we do is put a book plate in each book with the name of the speaker, the date of their program, and nice recognition for the Rotary Club of Columbus. We think it's a great win-win for everybody, and nobody's looking for another mug or pen. So thank you all so much for this participation in this program. We hope everybody is staying safe. Alan, thank you for your support of this program. We appreciate the work you and your staff do to help us thank our speakers in a way that both honors them and allows us to have a positive, lasting impact on our community. Before we introduce our program, I have just a, a few quick announcements. Um, Rotary Poker has turned out to be um, something that people are enjoying. It's turned into a weekly game 
So um, it's Mondays at 8.30. Uh, this is a friendly game. It's free to play. There's no gambling, no betting, no money changes hands. Um, it's good for beginners and experienced players. And if you're interested in giving it a try, contact the office and we'll help you get set up. Our online happy hour mixes have also been um, well received. And our next one of those will be next Thursday uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, you'll get a link and an email, and we hope that you'll drop by. And then the following morning, so next Friday morning, May 8th, we will return to having our breakfast mixes. And these are very casual discussions where one of our members has an opportunity to share about themselves, their personal uh, and professional lives. And it's just a, a chance to get to know each other better. And uh, next week, uh, Joseph Brannon uh, will share with us. So um, again, look for um, an email with a link and we hope to see you there. If you're interested in a Rotary Book Club or Movie Club, please let the office know. And I, I do want to say that um, these are really good opportunities to add a little bit of social time in our lives. So I'm appreciative of everybody that has volunteered to organize these. I hope that everybody will, will give one of these a try. If you have another idea, we're happy to try things out. Please let us know uh, through the office. So at this time, Cameron Bean will now introduce our program. Thank you, President Tyler and fellow Rotarians. I'm pleased to introduce uh, Stefan Bloodworth, Executive Director of the Columbus Botanical Garden. Uh, Stefan was raised on a farm in Durham County, North Carolina. Cows, horses, whippoorwills, and bobwhites were the soundtrack of his childhood. The forest was where he was happiest, and he learned to identify the trees, frogs, flowers, and birds he encountered there with a passion bordering on obsession. Fate took him to the jungles of South America and the plains of Africa as a college student at NC State University, and abroad, his fascination with botany and ecology became a confirmed addiction. His love of language and literature led him to earn his bachelor's degree in English, and his affinity for the natural world inspired him to complete graduate studies in forest ecology. Stefan spent six years as an undergrad and graduate student working for a series of landscape design firms to find a career that satisfied his creative interests and his affinity for nature. He and his wife Erica welcomed the first of their two sons in 1997 and prompted the beginning of a 25 year career as a landscape designer and contractor. In 2002, he began what would become a 16 year long tenure as the curator of the Bloomquist Garden of Southeastern Native Plants at the Sarah P. Duke Gardens on the campus of Duke University in Durham. 30 minutes from the woods he had explored as a child, he designed and built landscapes in homage to the native diversity of the South. The crowning achievement being the design and construction of the Bloomquist Piedmont Prairie. This one acre horticultural interpretation of a vanishing Southern ecosystem earned rave reviews from landscape architects and ecologists alike and spawned speaking opportunities for Stefan up and down the East Coast. In the summer of 2018, an opportunity presented itself in Columbus, Georgia that represented for him the culmination of many hopes, a position at a young garden with boundless potential and big dreams. It was with great humility and honor that in October of that same year, he began his new role as executive director at the Columbus Botanical Garden, a place he looks forward to devoting his creative energy for years to come. So President Tyler and fellow Rotarians watching, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Stefan Bloodworth. Hello everyone. I'm gonna jump right into my presentation here and, and um, we're gonna get going. And the first thing that I want to say is I've been a I've been a a nature lover for as long as I can remember, but birds have always held a very special place in my heart. And my talk today is entitled Birds in the Landscape. It's kind of the intersection of of horticulture and ornithology, which for me has a has a very, very special place. Um, and some of you are probably aware that um, that you know that birds are are really the soundtrack of our everyday lives, whether it's the kind of the the, the cacophony of the goldfish.
or kind of the 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 aggressive staccato of the Cooper's Hawk. <laughs> Or the elusive and my favorite bird of all time, the wood thrush. I never get tired of listening to that song. Now, at the Columbus Botanical Garden, we're endeavoring to, to figure out ways to engage uh, the Columbus and Chattahoochee Valley community in a fuller appreciation of our of our native songbirds. And we're doing that through a number of ways. Uh, this is an example of some interpretive signage that we're working on that gives people a sense of the what the birds look like in the wild, where they're from as far as their range maps, but not only that, also what they sound like, because that can also be a very elusive thing for folks to connect the sound of a bird and the bird's appearance because birds are often singing where we can't see them. So one of the things that we're working on is, is, is through the magic of technology, we can use our smartphones to, to, to you know, hear birds at any time. And so for instance, for this little brown headed nuthatch down here, uh, there's an app for your smartphone that's called just called QR Reader. There's, there's a bunch of them. You can pick whichever one that you prefer. But if you wanted to hear the sound of the brown-headed nuthatch, all you have to have is your smartphone when you would come up to this sign here and scan that little UPC-looking code. And then there you go. Gives you a sense of a chance to be able to see that bird, to hear that bird, and um, and to really kind of understand a little bit more about birds in general. And and that need to help people understand more about birds and their diversity in this part of the world uh, prompted prompted my staff and I to come up with a special symposium. Some of you may have actually registered for it that was uh, scheduled to be held this past spring. Um, uh, cor the coronavirus intervened and that, that uh, symposium or what we're calling the Samposium has been rescheduled for September 26th and 27th. And, this is really an outgrowth of, of, of just what I had learned in passing about um, this special man, uh, Sam Pate, uh, former Brookstone uh, professor of ornithology and uh, what a special person he was and how he touched so many lives and introduced so many young people to the magical world of birding. And we were really, really lucky to, to get a hold of this guy over here for, for this talk in honor of Sam, uh, David Sibley. If you know David Sibley, you're, you're aware of what a, um, an amazing force he is in the world of birding. He is probably the preeminent authority on birds in this part of the part of the world at this time. And he's gonna be our keynote speaker for that September talk. So we would love to, we'd love to see any and all of you there. And, um, and a really interesting thing in light of being able to hear birds, something that you might wanna try out on your own, um, the Sibley Guides, the Sibley Company of, of uh, Bird Guides has actually put out an app called Song Sleuth, which allows you to uh, one, both identify bird song that you hear in the wild and to actually play those songs and attract those birds to you so that you might be able to observe them up close. It's a really special little uh, technological nod to our absolute love and, and, and affinity for, for songbirds. And there's a reason that this is all very important. Um, in the fall edition of 2019 and Audubon magazine, uh, there was a there was a really a sobering article uh, that detailed the fact that North America has lost more than 25 percent of all of its bird species in the last 50 years. And these aren't just rare species; these are species that we would kind of call, uh, you know, kind of bread and butter species, the ones you see at your feeders all the time, or their numbers are dwindling rapidly and people have theories about why that is and we'll talk a little bit about that in a sec but it's really important that we engage our the young people in our lives our children our grandchildren our students the children in our neighborhood to help them understand this amazing world that for us is in many ways is just kind of the the audio backdrop of our lives but really important part of the ecosystem that surrounds us and there's a couple guys out there uh, Rick Dark and especially this guy here Doug Tallamy who are writing books that really kind of uh, bring it all home as far as like, what can we do in our home landscapes to encourage 
uh, bird diversity in our landscape. So bringing nature home and his more recent book, Nature's Best Hope, detail what we can do as homeowners to attract a higher diversity of bird species to our home landscapes and by association, our, our communities, our cities, and our region. And um, the reality is, is that at the, the foundation of this, of this, of this eco, of our, all the ecosystems that surround us, the foundation of all of those natural food chains are these guys here, the insects. From anything as small as this tiny gnat in the bottom right hand corner, to the picture wing fly, to the thread waisted wasp, to the metal mark butterfly, and especially this guy, right, green guy right here in the middle, caterpillars. Caterpillars are the engines that feed bird diversity um, in our world and uh, full stop. And in Doug Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home, he details some of the, the woody species, especially in our forests that, that um, can do an incredible job of attracting and sustaining butterfly and moth caterpillars. So you see right up here at the top, oak, black cherry, willow, and birch. So we've got those rock stars right here, oak, black cherry, willow, and birch. They attract together almost 2,000 different species of butterfly and moth caterpillars. It's those caterpillars that are those bird species are out there eating. They come to our feeders, but they get the vast majority of their calories from eating caterpillars. So how do we support bird species in our yards? Well, we support bugs. How do we support bugs? It's through the plants that we choose. And what I want to do is in the time I've got left, I want to go through some of these really important plant species for you to consider using in your yard to support the insects and the birds that feed on them. So for instance, hummingbirds, you like hummingbirds. You got the cross vine up here in the top left, the coral honeysuckle down here in the bottom right, the, cow vine, the trumpet creeper down here in the bottom left, those are all hummingbird vines and they attract hummingbirds directly. And then of course the passion vine up here in the top supports four of our native uh, butterfly species, uh, the, the, the Gulf fritillary, the zebra long wing, the Julia and the variegated fritillary, those are all all supported by just planting passion vines. And of course, the birds are gonna come to your yard to eat those caterpillars. And then down here in the middle um, is the pipe vine. And that's, that is, uh, that's an important larval food source for this, this, the, um, the pipe vine swallowtail. So again, these are some vines you can add to your yard that can really help to increase your insect and by association, your bird diversity. Uh, families are important, plant families. So for instance, in the rose family, it's a, it's a highly important plant, uh, plant family for attracting and sustaining insects and by association bird species. So you have things like the hawthorns, the, the chokeberries, the nine bark, the service berries, and of course our wild rose wild rose, all of which have these fruits that are high in antioxidants. So they, they, they provide good nutrition for birds rather than some of the invasive plant species that are out there like ligustrums, et cetera, that really only supply junk food for the birds as far as nutrition. These, this, these are important sources for caterpillars to feed on, uh, insects to feed on, and then for the birds to feed on as well. The sunflower family, bar none, is 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 in, in probably the most important plant family, um, herbaceous wise in your landscape to, for supporting insects and then also supporting birds. So I'm just going to go around here: the asters, the golden rods, the flea veins, coreopsis, the golden aster, the black eyed susan, the rosin weeds, and in the middle, the iron weeds. These are all really incredibly important um, uh, plant species for, for nectar, for insects that then birds are attracted to eat the insects. But then of course they also produce these achenes or these fruits that the birds feed on. So it's a great double whammy in your yard. Please consider planting some of the members of the sunflower family. And then the mint family, herbaceous wise, the sunflowers and the mints are the two most important families for insects and birds in your, in your landscape. These both are bee balms here. These, are, these attract a, a high, variety, high diversity of insect species as well as hummingbirds. But then you've also got the conradinas or the false rosemaries. And then down here, the mountain mints, very, very important insect species, insect attracting species that of course then will also bring birds into your yard. So the sunflower family and the mint family, if you take nothing else away from this talk, remember those two for adding herbaceous diversity to your yard. 
And then hard mast fruits. These are fruits like on the left here, the, the uh, bottle brush buckeye, but any of our buckeyes are important as far as that goes. That's gonna attract some of your, obviously some of your, your larger bird species, uh, you know, like your, your possibly your, your, your jays or your turkeys, things like that, that are gonna be able to crack those harder, harder nuts. And then of course, over here, we've got the male and female flowers of the American hazelnut, very, another very important hard mass fruit. But something to just keep in mind is kind of as we're finishing up here, um, you know, what's the, probably the most important thing to think about as far as your own home landscapes and what you can do. Um, feeding birds is great. Feeders are great. Um, they're, 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 all they are really, but the most important part for feeders is added calories as the bird parents are flying around gathering caterpillars. So essentially what the seeds in our feeders are is caterpillar uh, gathering fuel so that they can bring those back to their young. But um, birds also need obviously a ready source of water. It can be something as fancy as a, you know, a stream that you build in your yard. It can be something as simple as a bird bath, doesn't have to be moving. Um, shelter is also very important. So for instance, on the left hand side here is Elysium parviflorum. This is our, our yellow flowered anise, anise bush. This is a clonal bush, means that it spreads and it forms this big clump. Um, I'm a native plant uh, ecologist, and so I tend to specify native plants in the landscapes that I've designed. But any any kind of uh, evergreen clonal shrub that forms a mass is great for shelter. Birds can hide in there, get out of the wind. They can also hide from predators like the Cooper's hawk that we saw before. And then of course, brush piles. If you have the chance in your yard to, to dedicate a section of your yard or a corner to a brush pile, please do it because what this does is this becomes a haven for small little wood boring insects and then the birds get in there and they'll hop around in that brush pile and they'll feed. And then it also gives them some ancillary shelter from predatory species. And then the last thing that I wanna say is it's, it's important for us to know our land. So if you have land, even if it's from a quarter acre to a thousand acres, um, try to get to know the plants on that on that land. And if you know, if you go back to that list that I showed you of all the different species that attract caterpillars and sustain them, um, one thing that you can do as a homeowner is to become familiar with that that list and to figure out one, you know, bring in a bring in a botanist or a consulting naturalist and ask them to do an inventory of your property and say, hey, what have I got here? Am I supporting uh, native insects and then birds by association? Um, and then what, if not, what can I do to add to my property as far as that goes? So it's important for us to know the property that we, that we, uh, that we own um, in that regard. And, um, and with that, I think that uh, that's the end of my presentation. And uh, I, I, this is a, a bridged version of what I'm gonna be doing at the symposium in honor of Sam Pate in September. I would love to see some of you all there. Um, we are off, we are offering a, um, a a live streaming version of that for anybody that doesn't feel comfortable venturing out into groups of people at that time. So that's something that we're doing to kind of to um, bend around our new reality here. But um, but Cameron, I think at this time we can uh, we can open it up for any questions or comments that anybody might have. And and with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna close out my presentation. All right, thank you, Stefan. Uh, I am checking the feed. Bear with me a little bit. I have some win multiple windows open here. <laughs> uh, I'm checking the feed here on the Facebook page to see if there are any questions for uh, for Stefan, and I don't see any at the at the present time. Uh, I'm going to give everyone a minute to type out a question if they have one, but. Uh, it could just mean that you were so thorough uh, in, in your job there that uh, you know you answered everything people might have. Yeah, uh, like one, one thing, if while we're waiting, one thing I could do is to just give people a really simple update about the garden. Um, you know, we're when when the coronavirus hit, we were in a major construction phase. You know, built the construction of two new gardens, and that has continued. Um, we closed the garden uh, right in the middle of March and we're still closed and it looks like we may be closed through May to allow us to kind of put the garden back together. Um, uh, the construction should be uh, nearing completion by then and then we're going to be able to go back in as a staff and do all of the planting once the, once the contractors have finished all the hardscaping. But we'll have two new collections that are going to be really special to unveil at the end of the summer, our Georgia native perennial collection and our ginkgo shade garden, which is a Southeast Asian woody and herbaceous collection. So that's something we're really excited to, to open up to the public later this summer. 
Good deal. Well, I, I, a few questions have come up, so let's uh, let's let's jump on these. Um, one one is: Are the gardens open now? And if not, when will they be open to the public? Yes. Yeah, so so again, I, right now we're we're still closed. We we're we're trying to allow our staff to to continue working and to continue to be safe and continue to maintain the garden. And um, and I think right now my projection is is probably uh, one of the things we're shooting for is the first weekend in June to fully reopen. That'll allow allow the virus numbers to go down in our community and will also allow us to kind of finish up all these construction projects so that when we do reopen, um, we've got a beautiful garden to welcome people back to. Wonderful. Okay. Next uh, next question is: Is the ivory billed woodpecker truly extinct? <laughs> if I knew that, I mean, if I if I knew the answer to that, um, wow, uh, I would love the, the 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 dreamer in me hopes that it's not. Um, the fact that it's been so long since a documented sighting of that species, um, I know that uh, that some ornithologists at Auburn a few years ago believe that they caught uh, a vocalizing ivory billed woodpecker on uh, on on tape and and if that is if it if there it is true that they're still out there believe me i would be the first one to jump up and down and and, and shout but um and uh, i i can't i can't i can't tell you well okay well if if it if it turns out that there's one out there, Alan Harkness, who asked that question, will likely jump up and down and, and shout with you. So you have a, a warrior companion in the search for your woodpecker there. So good. Yeah. Uh, uh, another question here: Are there any non-native uh, plants that should be avoided or or removed that you could speak to? Well, so for for a number of probably the the the, the poster child for um, for plants that I encourage people to remove from their landscapes are the ligustrums. And, and unfortunately, the, both the, um, the, the, uh, the Chinese ligustrum and the Japanese ligustrum were staples uh, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s in ornamental horticulture in the US introduced from Southeast Asia. And um, they really got really well established here, not only in the horticultural trade, but then eventually they began to naturalize in wild landscapes. And so what they do is in, especially in bottomland habitats, the Japanese and Chinese ligustrums will naturalize and seed in to such a degree that they crowd out almost all the native species in those ecosystems. And so not only is there that concern that you're losing that native diversity but they also the fruit that they produce is high in lipids, which is fine if if you're if a birds are using it solely as a, a deep winter fruit. But um, it has very the nutrient value is extremely low, and so it's kind of like junk food for birds, and it's readily available, and they produce copious numbers of fruit, and which makes it much easier to spread the, the seeds for the birds, and have it naturalized elsewhere. So the ligustrums, the Chinese and Japanese ligustrums, would be the ones that I would focus on. If you have them in your yard, please consider removing them. Okay. Um, how about, uh, let's see, we have, we have some more time. There's some more questions here. Um, Marquette McKnight asked, what about bird houses? As far as yeah, I mean, I definitely think that I, I love, I love the idea of bird houses. And I think one of the things that as, as a, as somebody who, who loves to support the arts, I think that the kind of the cottage industries that have grown up around the artistic expression of, of the idea of bird houses is something really special. Um, one thing that I would, I would ask people to think about is uh, the placement placement in a birdhouses and to know a little bit more about the birds that you want to attract. So most people are, when they think of birdhouses, they're thinking of bluebird houses, typically speaking. And oftentimes bluebird houses end up getting occupied by other birds because sometimes just simply due to how they're placed. Um, if they're not placed in an optimal site for, for a bluebird, um, the bluebirds will, whether it's for instance, if there's domestic cats in the area, bluebirds will be very loath to, to come to that, especially also if they're not kind of on the edge of what we would call a clearing where those bluebirds can hunt for bugs and, and soar around kind of like a swallow almost, they're not gonna come. So, um, I mean, I love I love house, I love bird houses. It was one of the joys of, of being a parent 
um, having my children watch bluebird houses on the edge of our woods next to our house and watching the parents build the nest, watching the parents come and go, and then eventually watching the young emerge. So um, I'm, a, I'm a proponent of putting birdhouses on your property. And I'm also a proponent of feeding. Some people don't necessarily, some people are up in arms or, or there's you know, split opinions about whether you should uh, feed birds. Um, I think that, um, I think feeding birds in New York is, is great. Um, I love the ability for people to, I think it's one of the best ways for people to begin to become what you would call amateur ornithologists. And so once you've kind of gone through those 20 species, those usual suspects that would come to your bird feeders, and then you start to appreciate the fact that there's hundreds and hundreds more that will never come to your feeder, it just kind of feeds that energy, feeds that curiosity um, to go out into the wild and to learn more. And you use that Sibley app on your smartphone, the Song Sleuth, and and um, and that can really be the jumping off point. But often, a lot of times, people start as amateur bird watchers, as just people drinking coffee by their bird feeder. Yeah. Well, that, that's a great segue into the next question and possibly our final question. Um, Mike Venable said he's been using Song Sleuth for a few days and, and he's having a blast with it. And he's finding that cardinals are willing to be called up to the sound of that app. What other birds might respond well to that app in our area? Well, so for instance, you know, you, you would have your, your usual suspects around here that you probably would be able to get would be kind of the more some of the more social birds. Um, you know, so obviously things like your house finches might come. Um, uh, mockingbirds, mockingbirds might come just because mockingbirds are kind of grumpy. I hate, I'm not trying to anthropomorphize them, but, but they can be very territorial. So they hear another mockingbird and they might come in to fight with you. So mockingbirds would probably be, probably be able to bring them in. Um, uh, jays as well, same idea. And, um, and then I just think you should just experiment because, you know, there's 15 to 20 species, you know, from the downy woodpecker to the flicker, um, and, uh, the, and, and the, the, the house finches and the titmice and the chickadees, all of those are birds that are out there. Um, the towhees, things like that. Um, uh, and then the question would be is, you know, can you get some of these other bird species you, that you wouldn't see like the gross beaks and things like that, that might not be as popular at the feeders. Can you lure them from these green margins around your property with something like like song sleuth, I'd be curious to hear what people's results are. Well, that's good to know. So, Mike, be careful uh, about attracting too many mockingbirds. I, I don't imagine Mike wants to fight a bird. Um, but who knows? Um, how do outside pet cats affect the, the bird population? Uh, well, I mean, domestic domestic cats are are a real problem. Um, you know, there's no two ways around it. Even cats into their middle years um, will hunt birds. And and so it's one of these things, you know, we have a love affair with, with domesticated dogs and cats. And sometimes we feel bad about, you know, letting them out um, or not letting them out and keeping them in. Um, but the reality is, is that um, the number one threat to songbirds in North America is most probably um, Felis domesticus, the, the, the domestic cat, um, because they, they, will, they will hunt birds whether they need them uh, for food or not. So if you, if you are a, um, if you're a cat lover and your cats are, are, are indoor outdoor, um, you know, just think about that um, because, because it is a, it is a, it is a, a, a sad, the, the sad lineage of, of our love affair with, uh, with the domestic cat is, and then of course there's feral cats in a city like Columbus, you can't, you can barely travel, you know, walk up, walk up two or three blocks without seeing a feral cat. So those are probably the ones that would do the most damage, the ones that have no alternative as far as, as food and they have to eat uh, squirrels and, and songbirds. Okay. Well, Stephen, we're at 12.59, so I want to wrap up the Q&A, but thank you for your time. And for those of you who maybe had a question that, that I didn't end up asking, I know there were, there were a couple others, but please feel free to connect with Stephen directly. I know he'd welcome uh, getting to know everyone in our Rotary Club uh, better, and, and I know he'd welcome 
any other questions that you might have. And of course, he would welcome a visit to the garden as well. So, uh, Stefan, thank you for your leadership. We're thrilled to have you in Columbus and, and leading one of our important cultural institutions. And uh, thank you for your time today. So, President Tyler, I'm going to give it back to you. Thank you, Cameron. Stefan, I also want to thank you for sharing your passion and your knowledge with us today. I really enjoyed this program. And as you may have heard earlier, we have a, a proud tradition of honoring our uh, guest speakers by uh, donating a book inscribed with your name to the Children's Pub uh, to the uh, Public Library, the Columbus Public Library. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, thank you again. Yeah, thank you again for spending this time with us today. I now want to uh, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for keeping Rotary on your calendar. Next week, Tricia Montgomery, who is the newly appointed CEO of Paws Humane Society, will be our speaker. Tricia is recognized nationwide as an expert in combining health and wellness with dogs and their owners. And she's appeared on a number of programs, including the Today Show, Good Morning America, and Oprah. Um, she has a wide range of knowledge that makes her a uh, a perfect uh, fit for leading Paz Humane. So uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. And until then, we're adjourned.